Lucian, I'd like to add that the same thing was true for people who say they're atheists. There's a, a, a stigma. Uh, in s some way, they're not, they're, it, we're immoral or we're anti-American. Yeah, it's amazing how many crimes can be committed in, uh, in a fit of religious fervor of any you know, mainstream religion, and they won't mention those aspects to it at all. But if there's any whiff of uh, an atheistic crime or, or certainly, you know, any time there's an animal murdered or whatever, they decide to pin it on, on the satanic practice, even if there's absolutely no evidence of any satanic attachment at all. Uh, there was a case in Oklahoma when we were pushing for uh, the Baphomet monuments to go there alongside Ten Commandments monument in this... Uh, this deranged Christian kid cut off the head of his roommate on the grounds that he thought his roommate was practicing witchcraft or whatever. And the remarkable thing was the sheriff's department said that they didn't feel that there was any re religious elements to the case at all, even though I guess he had been watching YouTube videos about, uh, you know, his Christian faith or whatever, his, his Christian ideals. And he had this head full of demonology and everything when he did it. And they explicitly stated that as his reason for cover, cutting off this guy's head. But their reason for saying that there were no religious elements was because at the time they wanted to look into whether this guy had been inspired by Muslim belief, uh, whether he had any attachment to ISIS or whatever, because I guess the only religious extremism was going to take place from Muslim Satanists or whatever else. So even when he explicitly stated that it was due to his Christian beliefs that he cut off somebody's head, they just it just totally went over their heads as something that couldn't be. That that is nuts. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Brian, are you ready? I'm going to mute everybody and then you I can am. mute yourself and get the ball rolling. Excellent. Okay, folks. Hold on as I There we go. All right, and I think I need to swap. All right, is that is that showing correctly? Can someone just uh, quickly say in chat? Excellent. Okay, thanks. All right. Ah, wow. This is a great turnout, as as we were hoping and expecting, uh, and due in no small part to our our. We're very lucky to have uh, Lucian Greaves as our speaker. And uh, we've got people from Sunday assemblies around the world. We've got Satanic Temple people. And we've got people that they're just plain interested and want to know what's going on. So, uh, so yeah, let's get going. Uh, Sunday assembly is, uh, East Bay is an inclusive secular community that gathers to share the one life we know we have. So. They, we range from atheist to spiritual, free thinker, agnostic, none of the above, or you know, however you want to categorize yourself, but basically not feeling comfortable with what you might call conventional religion, uh, but still wanting, wanting to have the kind of community feel that, that people would normally get from a church. And there's just no reason that a church has to have a, has to have a monopoly on that. So we're diverse people that come together to create a community to live better, help often, wonder more, which is the, the slogan. It's a, it's a nice, concise, and, and I think these are these are great words to live by. To to just try to try to live a better life, try to connect more with other people, try to to expand your mental horizons. The Sunday Assembly was founded by a pair of bridge comedians named Sanderson Jones and Pippa Evans, who basically they were, they were atheists, but they remembered going to church as kids, and they missed some things about it. The, the community feel, the opportunities to help others, and just getting together to smile, laugh, sing songs, share thoughts, share good company, share good food, and, and all that sort of thing. And they're like, well, we missed that, and why does that have to be the sole purview of a church? So let's, like, let's just have something that is, is like a church, where people to get together and share their thoughts and share their company and sing songs, but without all the bother of like 
having to believe in stuff that is not necessarily all that. Uh, but anyway, it, so we, we are now a group of dozens of Sunday assemblies around the world, all following this model, live better, help often, wonder more, and in a mutual effort to help one another live our best possible lives. So of course, things are a little different with COVID-19, but we've managed to adapt the, the pro program uh, to online meetings that works pretty well. Uh, and um, in real life meetings, we have songs and we get together and we all sing and stand up and, and have a live band. And uh, we uh, instead, these days we have uh, music videos that we all sing along to, all muted and uh, not quite the same thing, but it's still pretty fun. So uh, we try to have things that are kind of thematic and topical. So uh, in, in memory of uh, the, the legendary guitarist, Eddie Van Halen, who recently passed away, we're gonna sing Running With The Devil. So we're gonna switch to music video mode. Give me just a moment here. Out louder, please. A lot of people in chat are asking for it to be louder. We know. My apologies. I think I know what happened there. Let me try that again. Welcome to the world of Zoom meetings. <laughs>
Okay, yeah, much better the second time. <laughs> the comments in chat, I, I, I couldn't, didn't know where the laugh was saying. That was great. I had a lot of people were into that. Cool. All right. So now, uh, rather radically changing gears, uh, we're switching to, up. Uh, yeah, go to there. So every week, every, every month, rather, we have a brief reading selected by one of our members. It focuses on one of the elements of our motto, live better, help often wonder more. I know I said that like 90 times now already. So, and it often complements the theme of this meeting or some, some current events. And this month we'll have a reading from Eric Bergman, one of our members, and I understand it's gonna be a guided meditation. So with all the stuff's going on in the world, I think we could all use a bit of calmness and clarity right now. So let's uh, hand it over to Eric. Thank you. I'll be inviting you to explore with movement and words what you hoped to give and receive during this Sunday assembly. This might be different from what you're used to. I hope it will be meaningful for you. You might begin by taking a few deep breaths. How present do you feel with others in this online Zoom community? Some of us may, on the one hand, be grateful to join others through Zoom, and on the other hand, be unhappy that COVID is keeping us from being with many others. How are you physically? Are you sitting comfortably? What does this mean for you in terms of posture? and where you've placed your feet and hands. How open or closed are your eyes? Are you looking at the screen or somewhere else? Is anything preventing you from being more the way you want to be physically and psychologically during this Sunday assembly. If you have such barriers, do you want to change? I now invite you to be in gallery view so that you can see many attendees. As you look at the other attendees, is there something you hope to give any of them or to receive from any of them during this Sunday assembly? Examples could be related to gratitude or openness or something else. What can you do to be more present for yourself and others during this Sunday assembly and to relate to yourselves and others in ways which are congruent with your good intentions? I now invite each of you to take a few deep breaths again to help you relate to yourself and others in ways which feel nurturing to you. I now turn the meeting over to the next person. Oh, yeah, thank you. That was, uh, might not have been, that was my choice to run the thing in that order, it might, but, uh, but yeah, that, that was nice. Thank you very much. Okay, so as we like to say in Sunday Assembly, what's better than one song? Two songs. Okay, so um, yeah, it's funnier when you're live and everybody's singing. So but anyway, yes, 
we have another song, Beds Are Burning. And this one was actually, this you may remember this is a popular song from a few decades back. But we have a music video that was done by one of our sister Sunday Assemblies in Los Angeles. And they've got a they've got a pretty good band down there, and they put together a, a nice music video with this. So that's that's what we're gonna do here. So uh, so Craig's gonna switch it over to that, and uh, we can all sing along. Broke the bloodwood and the desert oaks, holding wrecks and boiling diesel, steaming 45 degrees. The time has come to say fast fair, to pay the rent, to pay our share. Belongs to them. Let's give it back. How can we dance when our earth is turning? How do we sleep while? Nice. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, it's nice. It's nice seeing all the uh, folks along in the chat that are into it. That is that is really pretty cool. That that is how we keep this thing going, even though it's all online. I, I appreciate all the comments. Okay, uh, time for the main event, the speaker. So we're very pleased to be able to host Lucian Greaves as our invited speaker. Needs no introduction for many people in the room, but um, Lucian is a neuroscientist by training with a degree from Harvard who's turned his attention to social activism, especially in his role as the co-founder of the Satanic Temple. He's an outspoken proponent of freedom of speech, separation of church and state, which is a particularly important topic right now, and as prominently featured on the Satanic Temple's website, Empathy, Reason, and Advocacy. A little bit different flavor from Sunday Assembly, as you've seen, live, live better, help often wonder more, but I think people from both organizations may be surprised at just how much overlap there is in what we stand for. So without further ado, I give you Lucian Greaves. Lucian, can you unmute? Well, that's a rough start then. Anyways, I decided to wear shades, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, for one, it's a cheap embellishment, and I didn't put together slides. Uh, for another, people really seem to like my uh, strange taste in shades in the Hail Satan film, so I feel like it gives you the full Lucian Greaves experience. For another, it gives me a chance to give a shout out to the person who sent them to me, Helena. And another, I'm trying to practice the art of being expressive by way of using shades. So I'll tell you a few things about the Satanic Temple, and then I guess if we have time, uh, we'll do Q&A. That's up to the moderators. So the Satanic Temple is a non-theistic religious organization, and to some, this sounds oxymoronic, even hilarious. Some self-identified atheists express irritation at the idea that an ostensibly atheistic group also identifies as a religion. To them, religion is synonymous with supernaturalism, archaic harmful superstitious traditions, tribal supernaturalism or tribal supremacism, and impenetrable unreason. Atheism is a religion like bald is a hairstyle is what we constantly hear from tedious amateur comedians who are unwilling to abandon their position that religion poisons everything or that religion is the root of all evil to accommodate the nuance of a religion that renounces supernaturalism and advocates for reason. From a legalistic point of view, nothing could be more self-defeating and counterproductive. Religions are afforded certain exemptions and privileges that were meant to protect deeply held beliefs from unnecessary government infringements, but religious protections were never meant to expand the civic capabilities of some or diminish those of others. In recent decades, however, lip service to pluralism has become ceremonial and meaningless, while well-financed, well-networked Christians, evangelical theocrats have worked doggedly to press for religious incursions into the public square without consideration for the fact that other religious point of view actually do exist, and some may actually have the audacity to assert their right to equal access. These unexpected assertions of equal rights for minority religious viewpoints are what the Satanic Temple has become most famous for. When in a school district in Orange County, Florida, a proselytizing Christian organization was allowed to set up tables in school cafeterias for the passive distribution of their literature, a request by the Satanic Temple to likewise distribute a benign activity book was met with outrage by much of the community. The superintendent bemoaned having been overwhelmed by countless emails objecting to the notion that our request should be respected, and ultimately the school board moved to stop all passive distribution of religious literature rather than suffer the supposedly horrific, spiritually damaging indignity of our activity book. Where city councils insist on opening their public meetings with a prayer, the Satanic Temple is requested to be placed on the schedule to open one of their meetings with an invocation. In doing this, we have seen firsthand how uncommon it is to find a city council member anywhere who understands the basic constitutional premise of religious liberty as it applies to principles of government viewpoint neutrality and pluralism. Some city councils prefer to end a decades long tradition of pre-meeting prayers rather than allow a Satanist to speak, as did the city of Phoenix. 
Others will deny us and take their flagrant violation of our constitutional liberties all the way to the court, as did the city of Scottsdale. When theocrats from groups like the Congressional Prayer Caucus push model legislation onto state politicians to enact bills that call for the display of a Ten Commandments monument on Capitol grounds, they account for arguments that will judge such actions to be a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, prohibiting the government from making any law respecting an establishment of religion. But they do not account for other religious viewpoints demanding equal access and representation on those same Capitol grounds. In fact, their very arguments for the permissibility of a Ten Commandments monument residing on public grounds is dependent on the notion that the monument will be privately donated and that the public grounds are open to similar donations from other private entities. When the Satanic Temple has offered a private donation of our Baphomet monument to complement and contrast the Ten Commandments monuments, first in Oklahoma and next in Arkansas, we see very quickly that there is nothing neutral about the way varying religious viewpoints are treated by the same officials who argue that their endorsement of the Ten Commandments is nothing but a general acceptance of religious speech. This is where some people who identify their religious viewpoint as atheists sometimes nod their heads and proclaim that now they get it. Seeing the way we leverage our religious status to fight for religious pluralism and thus secularism, they believe that they understand the ploy. This, some of them assume, is a clever tactic in a guerrilla war against encroaching Christian nationalist theocracy. We have to argue from a place of religious identity, they believe, in order to wield the outsized legal advantages afforded to religions. This naturally leads to annoying criticisms against what they see as our choice of iconography. Why, we are asked, could we not have assumed a less inflammatory identity than that of Satanists if we hope to convey an uplifting and pro-social message? Why would we fight an uphill battle to redeem the stigma of a label steeped in a history of panic, moral outrage, conspiracy theories, and witch hunts? Surely taking up the provocative identity of Satanists must be a calculated effort to mock and offend Christians for whom Satan is the literal, literal living embodiment of evil. To the disappointment of some of these critics, it turns out that we of the Satanic Temple are not merely using the name and iconography of Satanism to advance and defend our deeply held beliefs and ethics, but we inextricably tie those beliefs and ethics into a framework of literary, mythological, socio-political Satanism that is truly and uncompromisingly our religious identity, which means as much to us individually, in isolation, in framing our worldviews and our place within the universal order, as it means to us in our relationship with the outside world, regardless of how others misunderstand our motives and beliefs. Many of us were raised in Christian households and Christian society, and we were fed oppressive superstitious beliefs that we came to reject on both rational and ethical grounds. In my own case, as well as in the case of many others, perhaps the timing of my conversion to skepticism was such, or the path of that con conversion was relatively unique enough that a Miltonic concept of sat Satan as the rebel against tyranny, the taboo name for everything that resided outside of the prescribed boundaries of Christian decency, played a central iconic role in contextualizing what I am as an outsider, a non-believer, a free thinker, with a set of deeply held beliefs that respect personal autonomy, equality, and individual liberty. We understand that blasphemy can be cathartic and liberating rather than something merely engaged in to harass and offend those who still hold to the superstitions that we reject. But this is not necessarily the only path to Satanism. As more people around the world come to understand our affirmative values and what we stand for, we have people who religiously identify with Satanism who are not necessarily raised in Christian environments, nor does blasphemy necessarily hold as much interest to them as the mere fact that Satan has become an obvious spokesperson against, against witch hunts in the face of the historical persecution of minority religions and heretics, a voice for science in the face of faith-driven outcry against basic facts of reality that contradict superstition, and a voice for equality in the face of Christian nationalist supremacy an icon of revolt in the face of theocratic tyranny, quickly making its way into realization with the Christian nationalist takeover of the Republican Party. For some, the Trump administration has made the meaning of Satanism so clear and intuitive that future generations might look back at the great satanic awakening and decide that it was Mike Pence who inadvertently gave birth to a new non-theistic religious era, as it was the Satanic Temple or any other group. 
For others, the lifelong assumption of Christian supremacy has desensitized them from seeing or properly appreciating the terrifying and rapidly advancing erosion of the wall of the separation of church and state, such, as they, such that they still see the satanic temple's efforts as little more than a crass prank, something not only designed to offend rural superstitious Bible-thumping yokels, but holding little value beyond that. After all, who cares if there's a Ten Commandments monument on the public grounds? Who cares if city councils want to engage in prayers? Who cares if religious organizations are allowed to leave literature out and for school children to either take or ignore at will. Well, we don't necessarily care about any of that, as long as we are given the opportunity to do the same. And when we are denied equal access, not only should Satanists be upset, but everybody who cares about democracy and equality should care as well. There has not been a time in which we have requested equal treatment, in which somebody has not argued that the presence of the phrase in God we trust on our currency and the placement of the words under God and the Pledge of Allegiance indicate exclusive license for Christian displays in the public squares and are indicative of the notion that we are a Christian nation and should be ruled by Christian ideals. Courts that can accept the preference for Christian iconography in the public square to the exclusion of some or any other displays of religious viewpoint expression can just as easily accept the preference for Christian viewpoints in legislation that otherwise impact freedom of conscience and individual liberty. Consider our lawsuit against Missouri there, they have imposed a 72-hour abortion waiting period mandating that those seeking an abortion first go to the clinic, receive literature that states, quote, the life of each human being begins at conception, abortion will terminate the life of a separate, unique, living human being. This statement clearly and openly is a religious statement taking a philosophical position, advanced into law openly by religious politicians with an unconcealed religious objection to the abortion procedure. The Satanic Temple has sued the state of Missouri on the grounds that they refused to accept our exemption from their law when we, have ex when we asserted that we religiously believe in our bodily autonomy and the right of those who identify with our beliefs to be allowed to access abortions on demand without being insultingly made to reflect on a state-sanctioned religious viewpoint contrary to our own that the non-viable fetus is, a, is, a living, is, is not a living human being, but rather a part of the person who is pregnant. We are appealing that case all the way to the Supreme Court now, having been defeated in the lower courts by ludicrous rulings, such as that waiting nine months to deliberate uh, nullified the case uh, of any potential remedy, uh, being that our once pregnant plaintiff couldn't be pregnant anymore. It's impossible to credit the notion that we are being treated equally in the eyes of the law even as they strive to contextualize their disparate treatment within the language of existing parameters, no matter how disingenuous. But of course, now we find our appeal reaching the Supreme Court at a time in which its theocratic dis disposition has suddenly been fully realized, and I have little hope that we will prevail. And I feel that there is a possibility that the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court, will be the Supreme Court that goes beyond the existing parameters and into a formal validation of Christian supremacy. Just as the Supreme Court recently upheld the right of, the Bladensburg, uh, of Bladensburg, Maryland to keep a 40 foot tall concrete cross on the public grounds, rationalizing that as a World War I memorial, the common usage of the cross as a burial, burial marker rendered it sufficiently secular. I predict that the court will find a case in which they have the opportunity to rule in favor of the revisionist history claim that the Ten Commandments were uniquely influential upon US jurisprudence and thus heritage and history can weight displays of Christian faith in favor of all else. We will then be explicitly a Christian nation. Having come for the religious minorities and having evaporated reproductive rights, then they will come for the LGBTQ community and all else with whom they have a sense of moral conflict. If you still think that what we are doing is a joke, you are woefully unprepared for the world that is directly ahead. Now is not the time for tepid replies delivered with the complacent benevolence of one who knows that the weight of history and the trajectory of current events favor their preferred outcome. It's not the situation we're in. We have to fight for the separation of church and state now with every available legal resource at our disposal. And if you still do not understand the dire state we're in, if it's too inconvenient for you to join the fight now, the negative consequences of an action are your fucking fault too. Write op-eds, let your presence in your communities be known, 
support efforts to preserve the separation of church and state, vote, and continue to press your demands regardless of the outcome of your vote. Thank you. Wow, all right. Uh, good use of the sunglasses, <laughs> definitely. Uh, whew. Okay, that's definitely giving us some things to think about. Uh, I think we'd like to, we try to keep this, this thing to an hour, but I think, you know what? We do have some time for some questions. Let's, let's just have a few minutes for questions. I actually had a, a question. Uh, so I uh, saw uh, an interesting interview with you where you were, you were making a point that something could be simultaneously satirical and deadly serious. And I, I found that very interesting. I wonder if you could expound on that. Yeah, I, uh, we get that a lot. Is it, it, so long as we maintain any sense of humor at all. Some uh, of the things you've done are very funny. I have to, and, and deadly serious. I, right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, I, and uh, sometimes they just can't help but be hilarious given a, the environment we're in because it underscores a certain absurdity, uh, the, the absurdity of, the, uh, of the, the preferred place we give in our culture to, uh, to bizarre beliefs and, and superstition. Uh, we're desensitized to it now um, because it's been so common throughout our lives. So it takes uh, something that seems uh, 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 something that seems provocative and outrageous to come in, like the Satanic Temple, for people to realize that this the notion that uh, any of these groups kind of come in and put their displays in capital rotundas or whatever else is kind of absurd, given how many different conflicting beliefs people have and how no one of them can be indicative of the entire voting population, even in sometimes the smallest of regions. Um, but, you know, from the very beginning, we never wanted to lose our sense of humor to this idea that it somehow uh, undermines our authenticity. Um, we're in a grim battle and if we're not having fun, it's, it's very easy to burn out very fast. Um, so even some of the things you've seen that look like a good time uh, as they're taking place are done under the threat of death or uh, with a lot of considerations in mind that have made that have made the events very kind of traumatic in the minds of the participants uh, uh, who were taking uh, who were who were engaged in them at the time. You can't laugh in the face of a grim battle and what is laughter for? Exactly. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think we probably want to get on track, but, but thank you very much. Uh, this, this, that was very, very nice uh, to have you on. Uh, you. Okay, so I think we're ready to switch to the next. Oh, wait, someone had, uh, did someone have another question? There were, there were a right. few questions in chat. Um, okay. You wouldn't mind I, taking one, maybe? Yeah, yeah, let's take one. Okay. Uh, here, then a, and a, here's a couple that uh, might be uh, relevant to the, the last discussion you were having. How, is there a way to get involved with activism, such as the, the temple, without uh, outing ourselves to deeply Christian family members? Uh, basically, is there a way to get involved with the temple in general? This is, that was a very specific question, but there are several questions about how to get involved in general with activism in this, in this regard. Uh, I mean, message us, look at our website and see what kind of campaigns we're, we're involved in. We have on our, our drop down menu some of the campaigns we're involved in, the litigation we have uh, currently going. And we're always interested in hearing from people who have any uh, professional qualifications that align with what we're trying to do on any of these campaigns or even just the volunteer time to to help with any of those things. So you know, the email addresses are, are available. Of course, if there's a, a, a local chapter, uh, look out for that. But there, there's, certainly, uh, there's certainly ways to, to reach out and certainly ways to, to engage in, in ways that anybody who's willing to, to work with it can, can work on the campaigns that we have in motion now.
Awesome. Do we have time for one more? I think so. Yeah, let's, let's do one more. Uh, there's so many good questions here. I know we're going to have to take some of these into the, the after assembly chat, but um, one uh, was really interesting was uh, from Beth, in a perfect world, would you prefer that religion have any place at all in the public sphere? Uh, no, I think uh, it, it originally crossed the line when they started to redefine, the Supreme Court started to redefine religious discrimination as leaving religion as a category out. And really kind of the pioneering case in that was the good news clubs versus uh, uh, Milford Middle School or something like that. But in any case, um, there was this after school program, evangelical program that was meant to uh, proselytize to children and, and uh, indoctrinate them with, with this authoritarian conditioning that they'll go to hell unless they act in line with uh, Protestant evangelicalism. And the horrific part about that is uh, some parents who otherwise wouldn't have had their kids indoctrinated in that way could sometimes be using these after school clubs as daycare. And some some school districts we found that uh, school would shut down early on a certain day and that time would be made up for with a good news club. So kids were, you know, just kind of being dumped into these courses where they were being taught guilt, shame, going to hell and all these other uh, superstitious notions that can be, you know, crippling to any, uh, any person of rational potential. Um, but in any case, uh, of course, there was litigation against having these Good News Clubs in public schools, and the Supreme Court ruled that not allowing religious after-school courses uh, to take place in the same way that secular after-school courses take place in, in, the, in the school environment would be, a, a, would be discrimination against religion. That was unconscionable, and they needed to allow it, and of course, they give that lip service to pluralism, and we did start our own after-school club, which we haven't, you know, since we first started, been able to get uh, liability insurance for again that's a struggle we, we have right now but in any case all of a sudden this idea that saying you need to keep uh, religion out of this forum became the idea of religious discrimination that's not religious discrimination I think that was a bullshit ruling on the part of the Supreme Court you can keep religion out of forums you can keep politics out of forums you cannot pick specific religions and say we'll take this but not the other that is religious discrimination so categorically, you should be able to deny these things, but the Supreme Court sees otherwise. Now they've extended that argument into so many other things that, you know, this idea of religious discrimination has just become, uh, it's discrimination if religions don't get a carte blanche of any public access. And uh, it's just kind of, it's just kind of careened out of, out of control from there to the point where I do think that soon we're going to be dealing with uh, this idea of the heritage and history of Christianity weighting it in its favor in the public forums as well. So I forgot what your original question was, but somehow I got here from there and I'm hoping you answered it. It, it, it looks like we've, we've got like one more like burning question coming in. So let's, let's, and we, we are actually making good time. So let's, let's let one more. Uh, Okay, do you want me to choose or did you have one in mind? Well, it looks... I, I have a I'm question. Sorry, I'm having Can a, I ask a question me. real quick? The chat. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Hi, uh, my name's Ashley Rule. I am very thankful to be talking to you today. Um, so I have a burning question because there is a lot of change and bad policies going into my area that will affect my family and millions of other people in the United States who have people with disabilities in their families. Um, it's even to the point where when a family with a, with a child with a disability asks for a fence in my area, they say you have to let your child be lost and you have to call the police when they don't even have a voice. So they aren't giving even fences to families because they say they're lazy and that they just don't want to take care of their kids who are disabled. So I just don't know how I can start making change in my area and across the country to something that's so near and dear to my heart. We're starting out uh, yeah, really, and this started uh, for us 
uh, originally when the Black Lives Matter movement started and uh, in later, we revived this when, uh, with the death of George Floyd and, and seeing just how uh, no substantial police reforms are even being put into place and how we were, you know, our honest feeling, at least my honest feeling is that a, a, a lot of the protest is not doing a whole lot of good anymore. And it, that's not to say that uh, protest is meaningless, but protest without specific demands. Uh, uh, the, the uh, protest should uh, should actually uh, act in conjunction with uh, petitions, specific demands of specific politicians, model legislation, the types of things that have really uh, benefited uh, the minority of religious theocrats who now have a stranglehold on the government and the judiciary right now. Um, to be sure, they are a minority point of view, but they have an outsized voice in politics because they do better than just get out on the street and hold signs and complain. Uh, they really do try to get people into political office. They lobby, uh, they have people uh, financing their efforts. They go straight to politicians and endorse their will uh, and try to impress that upon them. And they have a lot of lackeys in, in state legislatures all across the nation, uh, in the Congressional Prayer Caucus, and they, they churn out these model bills uh, uh, and some of them it really have these kinds of uh, far-flung agendas. Uh, some time ago when they were putting together these kinds of model legislation, uh, you know, reasonable people didn't think we would have to hear about fetal heartbeat bills or fetal burial bills. Now states are beating those back uh, constantly, uh, you know, on a regular basis because these are being pushed uh, so vehemently and so often by politicians who are owned by or or you know certainly loyal to theocratic interests and i feel like on our end we absolutely have to do the same uh we can't count on being listened to when we go out on the streets anymore i think politicians have learned all too well that you can let the uh the, the public uh unrest uh die away and especially if they're not making direct coherent demands there's nothing to answer to anyway. I think we really have to get involved on the inside. All right, I think, I think that's, uh, if we're gonna have to call it at that point so we can get back on track, but thanks, thanks for the good questions and the interest. I think uh, we're, gonna, we're going to have breakout rooms after the, the main thing. So, so stick around, there, there's, yeah, there's gonna be more. Okay, next, uh, next up is something that we call uh, doing your best or trying your best. Uh, so every, uh, every uh, month we have someone in the community come up and say in a, on a personal level how they're trying to live their best lives or some struggle they've been trying to overcome or just, just something cool that happened to them recently and it, it's a very very individual and very personal, and we're we're happy to have our uh, longtime member Sarah Shopkow uh, in to uh, say how she's trying her best. Sarah, you're, you're muted. Unmute. Oh, there you go. Um, can you hear me now? <laughs> um, excellent. So um, hello, everybody. Um, I usually do the doing my best in November because that's my anniversary of joining Sunday Assembly. Um, I am one year younger than the East Bay Sunday Assembly um, in terms of being a member. Um, so how are you? What's your response to that question? Mine is usually fine, I'm fine. No, really, I'm fine. Um, but about a month ago, I really wasn't fine. Uh, my computer died. Um, why? Because I spilled coffee on it in passing and I wiped it up quickly, but to no avail. Um, hmm. Leading up to the computer crash was what? My mailbox was broken into for the umpteenth time. 
Uh, my refrigerator was still giving me trouble. One of my favorite co uh, cousins died um, of pancreatic cancer. Notice how people tell you the cause of death more often these days. So to differentiate between whether it's a COVID death or not. Um, uh, one of my car's two batteries died and it had to be towed to the shop. Oh, and um, my mother died in June, two days before my birthday. And then of course there's the general state of our country. So <laughs> I was a little beside myself. So when the computer crashed, I just broke down. I was crying. I was, I didn't, I was paralyzed, emotionally paralyzed for, I don't know, several minutes. And then I called the grief counselor that my mother's excellent health insurance gave me access to. Um, now, I'm not experiencing deep sadness about my mother. She lived a full 92 year life on her own terms until the last six days of her life. And thankfully, I was able to fly through COVID skies to be with her um, for a few days uh, and at the moment of her death. So no regrets on that score. Uh, I miss her a lot, of course. Um, but when she died, I discovered I have a struggle on my hands because I have a new identity. While I'll always be the daughter of my mother, I am no longer connected by the physical. So I can't consult with her. It doesn't matter if I forget to call her. I have to stand on my own two feet. And it's been kind of a, an interesting journey to discover how should, I should go forward. Who am I without my mother in the world? The grief counselor was really helpful without actually giving me any answers. She did calm me down and she helped me feel like I hadn't completely broken the bounds of sanity. Um, she gave me some resources to think about and I'm slowly taking advantage of them. And I feel like I'm back on a more even keel still with lots of wobbles, but I'm doing my best to move forward. And uh, as for the computer, I stood in line at the Apple store for about an hour and a half and got a walk-in appointment for six hours later. I got it sent to Apple. 10 days later, they assessed it and told me it would cost about a thousand bucks to fix. Um, and I had it returned uh, to me. Um, and a friend found a, a Mac shop repair shop for me that says they can fix it for less than half. Still waiting though. Um, luckily work has lent me the computer I'm using right now. And um, I guess I'll just keep doing my best with it. Uh, thanks. All right, Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you for sharing that. I'm sure a lot of people's hearts are going out to you right now. I mean, it, it, it's hard to have a computer breakdown. We all know that. So, uh, it, and, and the other things. Uh, so, uh, all right. So we are going to, let's move to the next slide. So if you ha have a milestone in your life uh, that you'd like to share, uh, so it could be a, a, a birth, a change in job, or just something really cool that happened to you, or anything that's, that's personally significant to you, go ahead and share it in the chat and and we'll actually uh the, the co-host uh susan will be reading it out uh in a bit after we get to the um after we get to the uh, the small group meetings and uh so in addition um we generally after hearing all of the all of the parts of the presentation we sorry i lost track uh, it's, it's a it's a time for a moment of reflection. Uh, so sit back, take a breath. If you wish, close your eyes, and we're just going to pause for a minute and think think about the the things that we've heard about today. Thank you.
Oh, okay. Welcome back. So yeah, a minute with your own thoughts can be can be long, can it not? Uh, so um, uh, we're very happy to have all these people here. Sunday Assembly is free to attend. It's it's not free to put on. Uh, even in these days of COVID and not having to rent space, there there is a bit of expense associated with putting this stuff on, uh, like the meetup booth and so forth. So we never turn anyone away for lack of funds. And and I know probably a bunch of people are just here one timers also, but. Um, if you would like to and feel moved to please help uh, share expenses. We have a PayPal account that should, with a link that should be opening up in the chat window. And yes, there it is right there. Uh, and um, thank you very much for that. Uh, and while we're still collecting some milestones, I'll go over the, the small groups. So Sunday assembly, we have a motto. We're, we're full of mottos in this place. Assemble once, gather all month. So. We're still doing uh, all sorts of individual meetings and, and interest groups that we call small groups or smoops. And there's a, there's a games night coming up in just, a, just under a week. Uh, most of these are on Meetup, by the way. So if you join the Meetup group, you can find these. An exception is the philosophy group, which is on an email list. So on, on the 27th of October, we're going to have a, a philosophy uh, small group. And this is actually one of the longest running small groups. And in this case, uh, people have talked about defunding the police. What on earth would police be replaced with? And how does, how does that work practically? So there's a lot to discuss on that kind of topic. Uh, at the beginning of next month, we have a online Zoom social. And then uh, this thing we call Living Better Book Club, which is, uh, uh, I'm not sure actually what book they're reading this month. Maybe someone can post it in the chat, but but uh, yes, people find books about how to make your life better or how to uh, how to improve things or just uh, far more general than that. It's actually quite free flowing and just discuss that once a month. And music rehearsal, well, these days rehearsal, since we're mostly doing music videos is uh, is mostly just picking out things, but uh, but in, in the past, we've actually had a band, and in the future, we'll have it again when we're, when we're past all this COVID stuff. And the next monthly celebration is, uh, is on November 15th. So if you want to know more, we have a social media presence all over the place in all the usual spots. And uh, while we're getting ready for the last slump song, let's, uh, let's go through and uh, maybe have a few of the um, selected milestones. Yeah, we have a lot. So I'm going to try to get through all of them that I can. <laughs> That's, they're all great. Uh, Deborah has uh, had a baby. Calvin is now a month old. Congrats, Deborah. Um, Troy from Santa Cruz has marked 11 and a half years sober this month and will turn 50 this week. This week. Two great milestones. Awesome, Troy. Um, Mike has moved on from consulting to full-time employment with benefits. Gareth from Brighton has sat his possibly less, last ever professional exam on Wednesday. And if he passes, he will be a chartered financial planner. Congrats. Matt says he is recently cancer-free after a 14-month battle, finally on the healing path. That's awesome. Gemma says uh, around a month ago, she took the decision to take her redundancy money after nearly four years in the same job. That's great. Sophus has a milestone, uh, has been diagnosed with a rare case of epilepsy after about 15 years of not knowing what was causing falls. Wow, that's amazing because sometimes it helps to just know what it is, right? Amanda had bariatric weight loss surgery, and now is a month post-op and doing an amazing healing up and finally able to chew, fools again, chew foods again. Hail me. <laughs> Congrats, Amanda. Uh, Jan Tucci of Gainesville says her 74-year-old brother died of COVID in May. Oh, I'm so sorry. And they had a green barrel burial for him a few days ago. Uh, they have a Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery in Gainesville not only has green burials, but preserves the land forever. Her brother is now part of the earth. That's beautiful. Uh, Doyle says uh, his milestone is discovering the temple. Uh, had lost everything in life, uh, musical instruments, partner, job, and place of residence. 
but now knows he can trust himself. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shelley says uh, they have been living a fearful life. Um, finances, politics, global issues. We finally said we only live once and uh, you're going to, her husband, her husband are going to leave their jobs in a few months and move the kids and pets to New Orleans. Even for people who like to be alone, Maine is lonely for the Southern lady. I totally get you. <laughs> uh, Aganim uh, says that their milestone is they've lost a hundred pounds in seven months. Impressive. Get almost there. Uh, and uh, Rye says uh, last year uh, they were paralyzed, spent a year learning how to walk again, taught themselves how to stand and take first steps while quarantined during the pandemic after a tornado destroyed your house. Their house is finally habitable again and have moved back in, ready to start the next chapter of their life. I, they will never take their legs for granted again. <laughs> That's an amazing story. And I think those are all the milestones I see right now. I'm sorry if I missed everybody who came along later, but we will, I'm certain, talk about Oh, there's one more. Uh, Brandon says after many years of passing it off, he's taken the registered dietitian exam and passed. And one more, Ashley says nine, her nine-year-old brother with autism has regressed dramatically due to COVID. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, thank you everybody for sharing. It really brings the community together to have a sense of what everyone is going through and doing. Um, thank you so much. All right. All right, thank you everybody. So, so we are going to uh, stick around for breakout sessions, but there's still one more song. So, um, so in the keeping with the Halloween theme, it is the Monster Mash by Bobby Pickett. So uh, take it away, Bobby. My eyes beheld an eerie sight, for my monster from his slab began to rise. And suddenly, to my surprise, he did the mash. He did the monster mash. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. He did the mash. It caught on in a flash. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. From my laboratory in the castle east. To the master bedroom where the vampires feast The ghouls all came from their humble abode To get a jolt from my electrode They did the mash They did the monster mash The monster mash It was a graveyard smash They did the mash It caught on in a flag They did the mash They did the monster mash The zombies were having fun The party had just begun the guests included Wolfman, Dracula, and his son. The scene was rocking, all were digging the sounds. Igor on chains, back by his baying hounds. The coffin bangers were about to arrive with their vocal group, the Crypt Kicker Five. They played the match. They played the monster match. The monster match. It was a graveyard smash. They played the match. It caught on in a flash. They played the mash. They played the monster mash. Out from his coffin, Rex's voice did ring. Seemed he was troubled by just one thing. Opened the lid and shook his fist and said, Whatever happened to my Transylvania twist? It's now the mash. It's now the monster mash. The monster mash. And it's a graveyard smash. It's now the mash. It's caught on in a flash. It's now the mash. It's now the monster mash. Now everything's cool, Drax's a part of the band. And my monster mash is the hit of the land. For you, the living, this mash was meant to. When you get to my door, tell them what it said. Then you can mash. Then you can monster mash. The monster mash. And do my graveyard smash. Then you can mash. 
you'll catch on in a flash. Then you can mash. Then you can monster mash. So I think I think we're moving to breakout rooms. Craig, I would I would suggest that uh, we can move out to breakout rooms. Uh, I think some individuals just want to get into small chats. Uh, I think other individuals may want to uh, speak with Lucian. Um, once you're in breakout rooms, if you do want to speak with Lucian then uh, leave that breakout room. Don't leave the uh, entire session. You'll be back in a general uh, room. And uh, I think maybe that's the best way to approach Craig. Okay. Here we go. <laughs>